we have a really exciting panel for you today um, who will help us continue to explore this topic of the fierce urgency of now. I think that for myself, when um, Katrina Moore proposed this theme, I was just so excited. I just couldn't contain myself. It just seemed so relevant to what we are facing as a community, as a society, as a nation. Um, and I think that there's just so much to, um, to discuss and to mull over. So the way this next session will work is each of our panelists will share um, a brief overview of their perspectives on Dr. King's words and what um, the context of um, our theme is for today in the context of their work, their professional work or community work. After that, I'll ask them a few questions and get the conversation going, and then we'll open it up to all of you to um, start asking questions or participating in the program. So does that sound like a good plan? Everyone's ready? Okay, great. So I'll introduce our panelists. Our three panelists, I'll start with Chris Cato, immediately to my left. Chris Cato is the Green Initiative Project Director at Youth Build USA. It's a national nonprofit that puts low-income young people on a path to education and employment by teaching them construction skills and that help them to learn how to build affordable housing, community centers, and schools. Chris has over 30 years of experience in community and youth development, and with a particular focus on partnership collaborations, workforce development, youth leadership, and environmental responsibility. Chris is deeply committed to underserved youth, primarily in the Boston area. Um, in addition to his day job at Youth Build USA, he is a founding board member of Eagle Eye Institute, an organization that I'm also close to. Eagle Eye offers hands-on learning experiences in nature and conserves, connects city youth with mentors in the field in natural resources and science. He also serves on the boards of St. Stephen's Church and Youth Programs, a very well-known organization, and United South End Settlements. To his left is Cheryl Clyburn Crawford. Cheryl um, also came to speak here a couple of years ago, um, and she was so fabulous, I had to invite her back. Cheryl is the executive director of Mass Vote. It's a nonprofit organization that works to promote active political participation by providing the tools and resources to civic organizations so that they can organize, register, educate voters, and focus particularly on historically disenfranchised communities. Cheryl also serves as the second vice president of the NAACP Boston branch, and she serves on the board of the Women's Pipeline for Change. Um, I hope she'll tell us a little bit about that. Um, and the Garrison Trotter Neighborhood Association. Before Mass Vote, Cheryl served as campaign manager and then chief of staff to state representative Willie May Allen. And our third speaker, who um, shouldn't be a stranger to anyone, is Lydia Edwards. Lydia Edwards is a newly elected Boston City Councilor for District 1. She's the first person of color to be elected representative of District 1. <laughs> which includes Charlestown, the North End, and East Boston. Her campaign was a unique blend of white working class individuals, liberal hipsters, black, Latino, Asian, affordable housing tenants, and many, many others. Councillor Edwards has a demonstrated passion and history of working for social and economic justice that unites across ethnic and community lines. Councillor Edwards was previously a public interest attorney with Greater Boston Legal Services, where she focused on labor issues such as access to unemployment insurance, back wages, fair treatment for domestic workers, and combating human trafficking. 
Previously, as Deputy Director in the Mayor's Office of Housing Stability, she was responsible for developing and delivering innovative solutions to fight displacement. In this role, she successfully brought together all stakeholders to work together, including landlords, management companies, housing authorities, and tenants. Maybe she can share some insights with us today. Last, I just wanted to say that Councillor Edwards was a relative newcomer to Boston politics compared with her opponent who had served you know, in City Hall um, in a longer capacity and had the backing of the mayor. She really is uniquely positioned to bring an independent voice to City Hall because she doesn't really owe anyone political favors except the dynamic campaign and all the people of Boston who voted for her. So welcome to all the speakers and we will begin with um, Chris Cato. They'll speak from the table. Thank you, Shirley. And uh, thanks for the symposium. This is great. I have a request. I'm going to stand up. Um, someone help me finish the words of the song. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that is <laughs> <laughs> still so little love. Okay, so is that apropos? Does that fit? That's, and what this panel needs is a little bit more love. I want folks to come up, fill these seats. Please do that right now. Come on, come on. Let's fill these empty seats. Not going to start talking until we get these seats filled. Please, move. Thank you. Uh, I tell you, the chemistry in the room just changed. And I think it's, uh, if you think about it, a lot of times it's comfortable for us to sit in the back of the room, okay, because it's close to the exit. <laughs> and it's something we want to be comfortable with is how quickly we can get out. But think about it. There are, there are places where we go where people come, and I, I watch the dynamics in the room. And, and I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of students were sitting in the rows and a lot of community people were sitting in the chairs because they've been here before. They're like, I know the, I know the routine. I'm going to grab one of these chairs at the round table and it'll fill in. And um, I'm thinking about the, the, the words of the urgency of now, which is to, to encourage all of us to fill the front row first, to, to be a part of that as routine. And to have it, it's, you know, when, you know, when I was growing up, <clears throat> it was close that door behind you. It's just automatic. And there are some things that we just haven't gotten into our, our thinking automatically. So I'm on the board of um, a number of organizations. I'm on uh, Eagle Eye Institute, uses the power of nature to transform urban youth. And the idea is to help young people develop a connection to nature in a sense, to have a relationship. And when you have a relationship, you have a sense of ownership. When you have ownership, you feel like you want to protect something. And that's what um, we, we want, is to have some ownership. I'm on the uh, board of um, United Health and Settlements, and, and the idea right now is to, is to use the diverse community to help interrupt the cycle, cycle of poverty, knowing that there are people who have resources and there are people who are looking for them. To, to bring them together in partnership, and in doing so, um, we can make something very rich happen. I'm also um, <clears throat> working at Youth Build USA, which is a global organization designed to help young people 
um, in a sense, get past the few, few missteps in life, but to get on track in, in many ways to pay very close attention to what it means in reality to make it through the difficult conditions that we have. And, and when I say in reality is that it's, let's not kid ourselves. We live in a world of judgment and we have to educate our young people that judgment is a part of our society. So how do you manage through that instead of being upset and wanting to push back? And so one of the things I just want to kind of get to the, the front is if we're going to act, the people in this room, you're the mentors. And how do we create a mentor society? And I think that's one of Dr. King's messages is that it, it wasn't a simple, we're angry, we're going to march, okay? It was, we have an issue, we need to do something, we need to think about what we do, how we do it, and what after that happens. And right now, we're very quick to act in a lot of ways without the after effect. And I say to a lot of my community people, I, I, I'm on many boards and, and I'm walking through the neighborhood and someone will stop me and say, you know, you've got to do something about X, Y, and Z. And I said, you know, you've got to show up at the next meeting. Tell all of us what we've got to do. That's act. And it's not just act. Showing up at the meeting is one thing. Um, but we have a routine and a pattern. We have a routine and a pattern of throwing bricks from the outside in and expecting that to change what's happening on the inside. What we need to do is we need to walk through that door, bring our community with us, and have a seat at that table, and, and ensure that we have a seat at that table. The other part of my view in terms of environmental responsibility and, and youth role is for us to think about this planet as a spaceship. If we all were on a spaceship, would we be doing what we're doing to our water? Would we be doing what we're doing to our air? Would we be doing what we do with our weights? I mean, everything should be considered. If we use, look through that lens of, because we really are on a spaceship. This planet is just hurling through the universe at thousands of miles an hour. It really is a spaceship, but we're not treating it like that. That's one of the things in terms of acting, is raising awareness of what we need to act on. What is it that we care about? So what's the lens that young people are looking through right now? <clears throat> what do they see? What are they afraid of? What do they have hope for? And what do we do to support that? And then it's the, add the reality to that. What are the real conditions we have to um, train, develop, educate, and inspire? And some of it starts with re reassigning our standard practice of when we come into the room to exchange information, we've got to sit in the front row first and let the room fill up from there. And what we have a routine of is we, we start with the back row and then maybe it fills up in the front. We've just got to flip the script. That's one of the things we have to do. We're the action makers. You, you're timing me, right? No. Okay. Perfect. That's great. <laughs> um, and um, I just, you know, I want us to open up in conversation, but I want us to think we are on a spaceship. Much of what we are dealing with is finite. And we've got to start paying attention to what it is we want for ourselves. And if we do that in a selfish way, then we're going to hand something over to the next generation. But it's up to us right now. We can't just say, you've got a, you know, you've got a job to do. No, we've got the job to do of raising awareness, preparing, training and educating. And I, and I say that in recognition that there are 4.9 people who are undereducated, young people who are undereducated, underemployed in, in this country right now. Youth Build is working to bring them back into um, education, back into the workforce, but with an added level of awareness and an expectation that they demonstrate leadership on behalf of themselves, on behalf of their families, on behalf of their community. Um, and it's all on, on the, the playing field of service, of action, with a, a determinable outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Cheryl, please. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. 
Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Great, thank you. So, um, yes, greetings to everyone, to um, Provost Harris, um, Dr. Greenwich, and um, elected officials, counselor, all of the students and professors and distinguished guests in the room, thank you for being here this afternoon. It really gives me great pleasure to be here again. Um, and thank you, Shirley, for inviting me. Um, I am the executive director of Mass Vote, which is a voting rights and issue advocacy organization. It was founded in 2001 by a small group of community leaders to fight for political, racial, and economic equality with the mission to increase voter turnout, modernize election laws, and to engage the next generation. Um, we also re-grant money to base building organizations and provide technical assistance, and I will tie that in a little bit later. We exist to do the work that we're being called to do right now. The fierce urgency of now. We have to step into action. All of those words, fierce, urgency now we need to do it we're living in some very interesting times to say the least that are not very different from before you know 50 years ago we were experiencing so much racial unrest people were demonstrating and fighting for civil rights we were fighting for racial equality you know with the march on washington for jobs and for freedom and the reason we was marching then are still prevalent today the passage of the civil rights legislation, elimination of segregation in public schools, protection against police brutality, major public works programs to provide jobs. The same issues with a different twist. You see, there are two standards at play here. John Lewis back in 1963 said, the revolution is at hand and we must free ourselves of the chains of political and economic slavery. The nonviolent revolution is saying, we will not wait for courts to act, for we have been waiting hundreds of years. We will not wait for the president, nor the Justice Department, or Congress. That's a whole nother conversation, but I'm going to stay on this right now. But we will take the matters into our own hands and create a great source of power outside of any national structure that could or would assure us victory. For those who have said, be patient and wait, we must say, patience is a dirty and nasty word. We cannot be patient. We do not want to be free gradually. We want our freedom and we want it now. We cannot depend on any political party for the Democrats and the Republicans have betrayed the basic principles of the Declaration of Independence. Martin Luther King back then, you know, he said he would cash a check for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He gave his I have a dream speech, and he talked about in that speech the fierce urgency of now. They've been talking about this. And every time we have these conversations and I'm talking to folks, they are when something else goes down, they say, well, maybe people will be woke now. Right? Well, how many times can we say that? When I look at the current state of affairs, all the injustices that are happening around us, gentrification, across the country, the cradle to prison pipeline, when we talk about police brutality, homelessness, joblessness, just to name a few, the issues have not changed. There's still so much more to do. Democracy should not be this hard. The situation in 2017 looks a little different than it did in 1963. We have made some advances thanks to the courageous leaders that have come before us nationally as well as locally. We can clearly state, we can clearly state what is wrong, hence the seven article series in the globe on diversity. And you know, we're watching it, they can lay it out so clearly and see it so clearly of what's missing, where the gaps are, what are we doing, what they're not doing. My battle cry for 2018 is, and what are we going to do about it? You know, I'm actually talking to people, and people are saying to me, I'm tired of talking about it. And again, I say, so what are we going to do about it? See, you can't stop talking about it. And I get that whole thing, meeting after meeting after meeting, talking and talking, and we never get any action in place. What are we going to do about it? When, they can, when, when we have everything around us caving in, it, nationally, locally, and people can spell it out, when are we going to um, 
um, uh, what is it? When do we go? When do we see this? Is what happens when you go off script? Let me get back over here. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, in 2016, when we take a look at six million people, fewer people voted in 2016 than they did in 2012. Folks decided to sit it out, stay at home, or felt it made no difference. See, I know the challenges before me as an organization that is responsible for reaching leadership to encourage people to get out and use their voice to make a change. We understand that it will take a collective effort to help our communities understand fully the, powers, the power of their voices. We can't sit back. We can't wait. You know, in, in that vein, MassVote works with a coalition of grassroots community-based organizations. <coughs> our civic engagement initiative program. We bring in base building community organizations, provide them technical assistance, teach them how to door knock, phone bank, how to bring messages to the community, because what we feel is missing is the connection of the issues to the people. Because why else would you sit out when everything is caving in around you unless you do not truly understand how it affects you? And if it's not affecting you because you just happen to be doing okay, what about the rest of your family? What about the generations that are going to come behind you? What are we doing about it now? We collaborate with organizations like New England United for Justice, Neighbors United for a Better East Boston, Chelsea Collaborative, Cambodian Mutual Assistance. We are a statewide organization that primarily works in communities of, of color, low income and new citizens because they vote even less. See, my issue is voting. I think that that is my theory of change. People always want to ask me, what's your theory of change? My theory of change is voting, because I think there's power in numbers. Hence, all of the marches that we're having. And I'm going to say, like, the Me Too campaign, the Black Lives Matter campaign, there, are, there is clearly power in numbers. The problem is we act when we're on fire. No one's talking about Black Lives Matter right this moment. We're on to the next campaign, Me Too. But what are we doing about it? How are we educating? See, everybody in this room here is already, and those that are chiming in, are already civically engaged on some level. But what about the people that are not in this room? What about the people that are not paying attention? You know, and so I, I try not to be judge, judgmental in my thinking, because it really makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up when you tell me you don't vote. Right, like, you know, sends me in the shell. How? how? How could you be black and not vote? How could you be a woman and not vote? How could you not vote, right? So what are we going to do about it is my battle cry. What will we do to help move the needle? When I speak, you know, at these type of events, again, I'm preaching to the choir because you all already know. But my job is to really figure out, you know, our idea of democracy is, is to be inclusive, not exclusive. Mahatma Gandhi taught people to live with lion-like courage, impressing upon them that they cannot wait to leave things up to others. We have to stand up for ourselves, fight for justice. Ultimately, the only way forward is by developing self-reliance, forging a standalone spirit. You know, that is the only victory to path. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. You've heard that poem? We are the ones that we've been waiting for. Mass vote, you know, we really changed, we changed our youth program. We run a young civic leaders program of high school students. We're training them up. We've gone through eight classes. They go off to college. We're trying to raise capable individuals that no, not only will go through our program, we bring them in as sophomores and juniors and keep them for two or three years. But when we send them back out there, we hope that they will take will plant themselves in their communities, on their college campuses, because we gave them the solid, the, the, the foundation so that they could understand and the voice and the courage to use their voice, right? More people would use their voice. I don't think everybody's apathetic. I don't think people, you know, don't want to vote. I think some people are intimidated by the process. Then you have other people questioning, well, why vote? Why vote? when we get what we've got. That's all I'm going to say, right? Like, why, what difference does it make if I use my voice? People talk about the electoral college and how, what, what does my vote really count? We spend a lot of time educating people and helping them to understand you must vote. 
There, there is a no choice. I always ask people, is voting a privilege or is it a right? I'm a little confused, right? Really, we go back and forth with this. Because if it was a right, we'd already have some of the legislation that we're trying to pass now, like automatic voter registration. We're trying to pass automatic voter registration. I don't understand that if there's only two rules in this country, in the United States, is that you're 18 years old and you are a citizen, that if you're born here and you turn 18 years old, why well, you're not automatically registered. To me, that's true automatic voter registration. Give people the opt-out option versus the opt-in option. We'd have cleaner roles and more people. <laughs> it is critical that we and each of you, because I want to ask you, what are you going to do to help us move the needle? We can't do it by ourselves. We, we're trying with all of our organizations and pulling them in, but we need more people in rooms like this that are already civically engaged to stand with us and fight. You have to, at some point, symbolically, at the very least, we must take a knee. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Councillor Edwards. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say again, um, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you for coming to the students, professors, activists in the room. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my race, uh, what happened there, what I think we could be doing, and why this, this fits into the theme of the fierce urgency of now. Um, you have a little bit of my biography already in your pamphlets where it talks about kind of how I cut my teeth organizing nannies and house cleaners um, and helping to pass uh, the, the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. And that's, that's how I learned activism, and I learned that through the beautiful hands of immigrant women of color, um, many of whom were undocumented, many of whom taught me Portuguese, they then taught me Spanish, and um, taught me humility and how limited my law degree really was. And so, trust me, if you try to take on social justice, I think that this, the, the constant theme I've heard is you really cannot undo the master's house with his tools. And for many activists, that is a tool of that is, is a law degree. And you can, we can have that debate another day. But um, what I did know is going to court and fighting for the wages, be it $2,000, I go to court for $25. If she did the work, I was there, and I was the free attorney for nannies and house cleaners, and I got grants to do that. And what I learned constantly was how our symbols of justice, when they're defined with such a narrow definition of what is a just wage, who is actually working, whose work actually matters. If you start off a law definition like that, then coming there saying she may be undocumented and she was up all night taking care of your child, if I don't see women's work as real, if I don't see her as even belonging in this country, and damn it, she doesn't even speak English, then me asking for triple overtime, which is what the law says I'm entitled to, always I hit a bunch of walls. And so these women taught me that it was not in this courthouse that we were going to get justice. So I would file a lawsuit, and then I'd go outside the person's house who I just sued with a sign with their name stating, quite frankly, uh, it was John, Jack Craney doesn't pay his workers. And I was there with her. And so what we learned... What I, what I learned is that, and, and Jack then would settle, um, because we would, we would then go to not just his house, we let his neighbors know. Turns out one of my uh, clients was his driver, so we knew where he liked to have lunch. We went there too, and then we went over to the dinner spot and ended at the post office. So everybody in Belmont knew who he really was. And, and the point of that story, and the point of that moment is, is, is what I think we constantly have to ask ourselves, with all of the things that we are given and the tools that we have, to, to be an elite circle of folks who have a college degree, and that is a small circle of folks worldwide at, at these institutions, that, that that in and of itself is not the goal. It is what you can do with that and the analysis that you got to get to that degree that you must constantly go back to. Those women who were chemical engineers in their country sometimes, who had to come here and clean toilets because we refused to see them for all of their value, 
taught me more than my law school professors, and I love my professors. So I, I just wanted to let you know that that's kind of how I've, I've approached things since then. So here comes, I ran for office, I actually ran in a special and I lost for the Senate seat. And um, people were like, good show, all right, you, uh, wait a second, did this black girl just win East Boston? And I said, yes, I did. I worked really, really hard. I speak Spanish. Actually, 60% of East Boston is Latino. <laughs> Let me talk. And they're like, okay, fine, whatever. So um, I went to work at the city. I worked in housing stability and focusing on displacement. And it's a, something I was very passionate about. And I began to learn about housing policy. I went to Buffalo. I learned about the organizing and, um, and how to, they're building up Buffalo and doing a massive movement in uh, community benefits agreement agreements, making sure that the projects are green, making sure that they're including Buffalo residents, making sure they're including people of color, and seeing community organizing and holding developers accountable, that's where I learned, right? So I go there, I also got involved in the cooperative movement and building alternative economies, I'm a sustainable economies law fellow, and focusing on how we build the society we need to. So I bring all this to that job, I'm excited, bam, my city councilor says he's not gonna run again. Another election. And I go to gather and I go to talk to folks and I say, I would love your support. And, and it was just the, the, the utter ridiculousness that they looked at me like, you understand what's in your district, don't you? It's not just East Boston, it's the North End. And not the, the fake North End that is Rose Wharf and the waterfront. This is, this is the real North End. This is the Italian North End. And, and add to that, the second largest part of your district is Charlestown. Charlestown. So, and the quote was, they hate Italians. What do you think you're gonna do with your black ass? <laughs> right? Um, that did not come from anybody in Charlestown. Okay? That came from my awesome liberal white friends who don't live in Charlestown. So, on September 26th, we won Charlestown, we won East Boston, and then on November 7th, we won the entire race, again winning Charlestown and East Boston, and then increasing our percentage in the North End. And what it's, what's really important about this is, and this is a quote I often say um, from this article, on paper, Edwards had no business winning this race. That's what the reporter said. Um, and that's because you looked at paper and we decided to define ourselves and our community and our neighbors through a historical lens, very important to see, but also not, it's not fair to be limiting an entire community based on that, people do grow. And finally, we also limited my, our perceptions of what a black politician can do. And that's true. So, so they forgot I spoke Spanish. They forgot I spoke Portuguese. I am not Latino. I earned my cred. I earned my cred. I stood outside the, the White House when Obama was deporter in chief, and I marched in the streets, and I was at the airport when uh, Trump put in his ban. I'm consistent. I was there, and that's important for people to know. Don't just show up when it's really well for you. I wasn't running for office at this time. I was standing up for my clients. She didn't have anybody else. And I think it was through that constant fight and grind I got to be known amongst this community. Meanwhile, a lot of my Italian friends and who had been traditionally political had no idea who I was. I was the black horse, literally, that they called me. I was the black horse that came in and won. And I, I bring this up because I learned through this race, um, you, we can win, bold progressives can win if you truly run on all of you. Run on all of you. All of me had to come out this time. The last time I ran, I ran as who could be the most progressive. And so we ended up in a firing squad and probably shot each other out. This time I ran on, this is Lydia Edwards. I come from a single mother who was a veteran of the United States Air Force. I learned these languages organizing individuals. I am a proud member of the United Auto Workers Local 9 due to my work in legal services. I ran on being pro-union. I ran on, on uh, being inclusive. I ran with materials in many, many languages. And I ran on the record of fighting for all. And so when I knocked on the doors in Mishawam, which is called, or traditionally called, the, the White Project, we won. Because I didn't run away from who I am. 
I didn't run away from the message that we all deserve to be in Boston, that displacement is a problem, that we are overdeveloping and developing a lot of our long-term residents out. I didn't run away from being a progressive, but I didn't also run on just being a progressive. Do you understand the difference? Right, sitting up there and using beautiful big words about how awesome and great we are, that's running as a progressive. Going out there and talking about the damn principles that support a progressive agenda, that's running as a progressive. And so I think it's important when we think of the fierce urgency of now that we really break down what that means. Fierce to me means being unafraid, being, being bold, um, and, and being transparent. I'll tell people if I can't do it. I'll tell them if I need their help. That's really important for fo folks to remember. Um, urgency. This is really important. When I, when I think of the word urgency, my biggest, one of the things my friend told me when I was part of organizing and wanting to use my law degree all the time, she said, you know what, Lydia, you can get some place by yourself way fast. You can get there faster than a lot of people. But we can get there further. We can go further if we stick together. And that's the problem that a lot of us have and have seen repeated throughout our progressive movements is that we will say, all right, listen, the women's movement is just easier to focus on middle class white women, go. Then to have that deep conversation about who is a woman, who deserves to be in the room, are we dealing with class and so on and so forth, because that takes longer. That takes longer to translate something in a different language. It takes longer. But if you fast forward, when we're dealing then with backlash for the advances for one group, they look around and they're like, well, where's, where are the rest of you to help me out? Oh, it's called divide and conquer, sweetie. You went off, right? Didn't listen. We weren't there. You can look at the environmental movement, which is overwhelmingly defined by upper middle class white individuals. You can look at so many different movements, even in the, in the uh, racial justice context, where many men took off, took the mic, took and left a lot of women behind, and then who was there or who wasn't there? We have got to remember, urgency does not mean rushing to the finish line. Urgency means building a real movement and taking the time to do that so that we are constantly checking in with each other. You must be urgent, you must be fierce about that. And that, I think, right now, with the current leadership that we have in DC, is what's kind of happening in a way that has not been happening before. I'm really concerned about how frustrated we get at each other. Would you just stop complaining? Seriously, oh, we can't include everybody. Really, because oppression includes all of us, shit. I mean, it really does. Oppression has no problem at gathering us all in. I can't imagine that a response to oppression and coming up with solutions can't involve all of us at the same table. Um, just bringing it back into the urgency of now, too, and specifically talking about Boston, you know, and, and what I feel folks could be doing. Um, so I'm two and a half months elected. Into this, into this job. And yes, I, I'm lucky, I'm blessed. I really don't owe anybody anything. Um, we were outraised, we, you know, we used our money efficiently, but honestly, we're at a position where we can just lead. And so today I introduced an anti-speculation ordinance and the hearing will be coming up where we go after flippers, where we go after foreign speculators, where we go after um, Airbnb or short-term rentals, and we're going after individuals who are attacking our housing stock. Um, and what I need, and what anybody who's trying to do and have that tough conversation is y'all, to show up. Because you'll show up, progressives do, to hold me accountable, no doubt. You'll show up there to say what I didn't do right. I'm serious, and that's the, that's the job too. But I'm really asking, like, will you show up when I say I have a hearing, and I need, I need people to see that this is matters to more than just my little office or my district. That's the question. Um, when you show up, it can't just be to talk about what people did wrong. It has to be able to support a vigorous movement. Um, and I'll just end on, on that, because I know we have a lot of conversation. But I just wanted to say, again, thank you to the, not only to you, but to the coalition, as you alluded to earlier. The coalition included Latinos. It included um, Chinese Americans, blacks, working class whites, hipsters, college students, union members, seniors. Um, and Trump supporters, a massive amount of Trump supporters came out and voted for me as well. So please know that you can connect with anybody. Um, 
I'll just start with a couple of questions. The first question is, thank you so much, by the way, for all of, all of your presentations. It was amazing to hear the stories. Um, my first question is actually from one of our faculty members, Dr. Kendra Field, who's here. Um, what from your past shapes your work and inspires you? Do you draw, is there something that you draw from history from Dr. King or others um, you know, that kind of keeps you going? Chris, do you want to start? <laughs> what keeps me going? I was blessed with growing up in a um, very tight community in the south end of Boston. And um, it, um, it's where I got my activism roots because everyone around me was doing something. You know, we had an empty um, piece of uh, property that wasn't being used. It was turned into a playground. Um, we had issues of housing. People came around. And, and so I grew up at a time of, of significant activism. But I didn't know that's what was going on. I just, that was my growing up. And when I moved out of the community, it's when I realized that I was blessed because it was the routine. And so I, community organizing came natural for me because it was, this is how we did it. And so I'm actually in the, the, the process of trying to remind many of our new South Enders what the old South End is and um, it's it's kind of disturbing because we're at this place of this gentrification process and you got these newcomers who are saying well we can just make it better and I'm saying but there was nothing wrong with it to begin with and it's like well if we could just get these young people off our front steps I says but that's your security right there they're watching the neighborhood in your house <laughs> um, you know and so this this so I guess I I grew up in it and my old friends, we get together and we laugh about the fact that we had this beautiful experience growing up and, and we cry about how unique it is. Thank you, Chris. So um, what shapes, so I, um, I think because I come from, with all things being disclosed, I come from a political family. Congressman Clyburn's my cousin in Washington. Um, I have um, Willie Mae Allen, who I worked for as my aunt, my mother's little sister. Um, I have <laughs> senators and state representatives across the country um, in South Carolina and all over, right, that are state representatives, city councilors, and things of that. So it's kind of like was, I was born into it. But truly, my father was the first community organizer that I knew. I grew up in Dorchester, Mass. My father used to run Summer Thing. And so um, he would organize all the youth, all the boys. He used to call them all bums. And all the girls, he used to call them all chickens or hags, right? And he used to just keep the community together. And we used to do block parties. And so when, when I was younger, I, I kind of, they would say, I would be doing door knocking and didn't even know I was door knocking, right? Like they'd say, hey, run this up the stairs and put this on the door. <laughs> and you run up the stairs and you put it on the door. But I think about the large family. I have nine brothers and sisters. So my father kind of ran us, ran us like, you know, we were in the military because there were so many <laughs> kids. He knew he had to do things to keep us active. Um, and he gave us the voice to stand up for other people. So I always feel like I am the voice of the voiceless. You know, I'm not afraid to speak out on issues that are affecting our community and to help other people get to that place. Thank you. I feel um, I kind of answered that a little bit in my previous comments about domestic workers. That's really where I learned uh, the most. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna ask one more question and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, what are your thoughts on the role of young people today in our future? Some of you alluded to this, but you know we have a number of college students here. We have professors who teach college students, um, and there's a lot of young people in all our lives. So, what thoughts do you have on that? Um, I think there's a couple um, places where young people. I mean, first of all, everywhere, everywhere you belong, everywhere, and doing everything, running for office, doing amazing things, and thinking and holding people accountable. Uh, but you must do so off campus. So that's one thing I, I I would encourage a lot of folks to do is to get out of 
off of campus and get into communities, not necessarily renting there and, and driving um, the prices up, but um, certainly going out there to community <laughs> meetings. I, I have found um, uh, one of the things that I find frustrating and in this job and in my prior job is I get a call, and this is no offense to anyone who's studying media or, or journalism, but this is a typical call. Hi, I'd like to speak with you about housing and gentrification. Okay, what's your name? Okay, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, Johnny, blah, and I go to X university, I'm, I'm, I'm writing for the newspaper. Wonderful. And so, yeah, I'd love to talk to you about it. Excellent. All right, you know, that's it. But I have a deadline, so I need to talk to you. <laughs> and I'm like, first of all, please don't ever do that. You have a deadline, I have someone who's homeless. What do you, what do you, what do you, whatever. So, so then they want, they have their deadline, and then the questions go, so um, tell me what your thoughts are on um, gentrification. Tell me about East Boston and what you see going on. And I'm like, tell me that you know, I don't know, how to Google something. And then tell me, even more importantly, that you don't, you're, you're asking me to write your paper for you. Give me a break. I mean, it's so obvious. And my biggest concern is that this person, in their research and their reaching out to the community, is doing it in such a condescending, tell me, versus I'd like to know, or I'm going to go find out, or I'd love to accompany you when, or I'm going to volunteer. So none of that comes out of that person's mouth. So this is my invitation for you to do with instead of ask that someone tell. Um, and as used, that's really, really important. Um, and that, that probably also goes for a, a lot of professors too, because they're learning how to uh, investigate, to learn, and to research from professors. So, so uh, you, you share part of that wonderful burden of growth. Um, and so, but I do hope, more importantly, that you feel that your generation is probably the most intelligent, the most inclusive, the most um, altruistic, honestly, that we've ever had. And I hope that you take that, don't lose that, and, and lead. Thank you. I, th I think the young people really have what it takes to bring us forward. This, the element of step into what's a little uncomfortable. Ask the why more. Push a little bit harder. Because we're learning that when we don't do that, we are getting, in a sense, what's left for us. And more and more, we're, we're discovering that's not much. And so we have to ask, why isn't that? And be that, um, I'm learning still, to be that uncomfortable voice at the table and to call out what's not right and to educate your people around. Um, and I think that's young people are the, you are the educators. You know exactly what your concerns are. Your concerns have to become everyone else's concern. And we have to support your addressing those through education, through training, through our experience. But you've got to, you've got to ask the why and the why not more. So, um, so I got a little disillusioned recently. I almost changed careers. I thought about changing careers. Like, you know, I'm like, folks won't fight for themselves. You know, I'm disillusioned with the leadership. I'm like getting over this. I'm fighting harder for people to, that won't fight for themselves. And so, um, I, I, and Dr. Greenidge said it, that everybody can't be out here doing the same thing, right? I had to take a step back and start thinking about, right, everybody can't be on the forefront holding the signs or whatever at the rallies, but we need everybody doing something. And so I decided to change my youth program. So we have our Young Civic Leaders program that they, they were coming into the office uh, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from four to six, two hours a day, and then we do some weekend work or whatever. What I realized, and I'm not getting two hours, they're fooling around the first 15 minutes and the last 15 minutes, so I'm only really getting an hour and a half. So I decided that we would change our youth program to a Saturday program. 
and we're going to do from 10 to 3. So I'm in the, it, this is, um, I'm looking for a youth coordinator right now, but oh. part-time youth <laughs> coordinator right now to run a robust, because I hire high school students. I think we need to get to them just a tad bit sooner. You know, I remember High Square Task Force came out, their youth came out with this campaign saying, I can't vote, vote for me, talking to their parents. Like, you all are not voting. So now we're sending messages home through the school system, through the youth, to say to their parents, can you please go vote? Schools are falling down around us. We need you to go vote. We need you to show up. And so I think you are the messengers of the future. We know that in everything that we do, if we're not raising capable young people, we're doomed, right? And as Councillor Edwards just said, you all are so bright right, and so inclusive, that we need to harness that. But I think we need to start just a step lower, high school students, so that by the time they're going into colleges, they know where to go. They can come to Tisch, right? They can be a part of Circle and those kind of programs. But the youth are our future. We know that. And I'm excited about that. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round. take this off, but let's open it up for questions um, from the audience. Maybe you could come up, or could I get some help with the mic? <laughs> I don't know how this thing comes up. Oh, there it goes. So who's a brave soul who would like to ask the first question? Hi, uh, this question's for Cheryl. Um, Maybe you could identify yourself. Sorry, yeah. Uh, my name is Liza Birkin. I'm a master's student here at Tufts in the urban planning department. Um, this is probably something Googleable, and I apologize for that, but maybe we could talk about it here. So I, during this last uh, election in Alabama, I was so inspired. There are all these videos of, of uh, people, mostly women of color, doing um, actual driving people to the polls just on their own, which I thought was so cool. And I'm just wondering if there are going to be, if there are or are going to be um, opportunities for things like providing transportation and childcare and, and physical concrete ways to uh, help get out the vote. Absolutely. And so on my website, there's something that's called um, volunteerism. So you can click on it and you can sign up. You can let us know what types of things you're, you can look through our website, see what types of things you're interested in and when you're available. But there are, are always opportunities. We run an election day operation every election. Um, we're always, and I take it, my office is downtown Boston, but I always take it into the community and work out of somebody else's office. We're offering rides, we're, we will, we have, we offer food, volunteers, we're making phone calls all day long. The night before, we're out putting up door hangers. We make a big party out of everything and just the more the merrier. And so we're, there are always opportunities to volunteer with our office, yes. Awesome, thank you. Other questions? Okay, you can go after him. Hello, my name is Zach Holler Peter. I'm a resident of East Boston. Um, this message is for this question is for Cheryl. I'd just like to ask um, on the 31st, I know there's an automatic voter registration lobby day going on, and I was wondering how I might best prepare for that going in. So we have a fact sheet that gives you all the information around it. It starts at 9.30, registration opens up at 9.30, we'll start the program at 10, we'll go out and we'll visit legislators, um, the representatives for the first hour, and then the senators. So if you come to the State House, you'll be assigned to a group, we'll do a short training that morning for about 30 minutes, just best practices to get people feeling comfortable. You'll pick a spokesperson in your group to lead the questions and things, but it, there's power in numbers. So when the legislators see their constituents coming up to the office to talk about automatic, and they're all in favor of it. Quite frankly, they're pretty much, they're in favor of automatic voter registration. The only thing keeping them from passing it is inertia. 
Yeah, hello. My name is Jonathan. I live down the road. Um, I moved here from Israel just some months ago, and I've noticed that in the States, there's a lot of small talk, much more prevalent than where I come from. And, you know, we've gathered here today to talk about big talk. There's a lot of big issues that you've raised that we're all engaged with. And you're calling us to action to go home and engage those around us about these issues. But I just see so much small talk around. And I have a question to you all as to how would you suggest we go home and just delve straight into these things, you know, without, without all that small talk. Like, let's get down to it. So what would your suggestions be to us? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm compelled to share a little bit of a story about uh, Youth Build, and um, Youth Build USA is in 265 communities around the U.S., and we're in 18 communities around the globe, and Youth Build started working globally um, by invitation from the South African government, and what they said was, we have an issue with our young people right now. For so many years, the young people of the country were fighting apartheid. And in doing so, they had to get educated. They had to get organized. They had to know who was what and where and when and how. And once that fight was over, the young people started to wander in all these other directions. There was nothing pulling them. And so the government came around and said, wait a minute, we we're going to lose our young. After all of this effort of bringing this energy to this uh, achievement, um, we're seeing violence and crime. And you, these things were starting to bubble up because there was no what happens now element. And, um, and so I, not necessarily responding to the, the small talk piece, but it's really we've got to start acting like we're in those levels of challenges. We've got to start really acting. And so it's, it's the talk moving into action to some outcome. And we've got to think that the concerns that we have are not small ones. The concerns that we have are they're, they're not small. We've got to start acting in accordance to how big our concerns are. So I'm going to piggyback on that. I think the small talk is great. Because one of the things that we're moving from is transactional to relational. When you're trying to get people to move. A lot of the work that I do in giving out this money to organizations, um, they must give me data, right? That means they need to track who they're talking to, how many times you're talking. Because that data um, um, really shows the impact that we're having. And that's how I continue to get funding to give out to the groups. However, that's called transactional. They hate me for it, right? I make them give me all this data and stuff. But what we started to realize that is that we need to have build relationships, community, in our communities, around us, in all the spaces that we occupy. Having small talk is a good thing, but just bring into the fold something that we want to do. Do you know what I mean? Like, we have to build these relationships. We can't get people to move. We started this project um, at Mass Vote. Um, it's our super voter project. We were looking for super voters, people that vote without you telling them there's an election. Their job to join this group was to find 10 people that were their family, friends, and colleagues, circles where they had some level of influence, and to monitor them. Make sure they came out to the forums. Made sure they looked at the candidate guides. Made sure they were in the spaces so that they can learn and, and distinguish between the candidates, right? Doing that kind of thing. But what we realized is that, like, I could call my family, and there's a lot of us, I would call them, and they would respond to me better than if I'm just cold calling, knocking on someone's door. So I think the small talk is important because that is exactly how we build community and relationships, and people move with relationships. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think being in a campaign where, um, and Zach is one of my top volunteers, by the way, so Zach, thank you so much, but um, it was all about the small talk. I mean, I personally knocked on 10,000 doors, right? So I don't know, maybe probably had two or 3,000 conversations over the course of nine months. It is that moment where, where you connect and where you can talk, where they can, where they can say, well, she came by. So it's so much harder to make me the other. And it's so much harder to make somebody else the other. 
if you're having some good conversations uh, about issues. Um, I would caution that this, the one critique I would have about small, ta small talk, especially in, in, in college campuses, that it's too much of it happens on campus, right? With folks who are either in your class or kind of who you gravitate towards naturally or don't or whatever, you, you engage in a different uh, kind of conversation than you would with someone who has two, three kids, didn't graduate from high school, but still, you know, I need her vote. So she needs to know me real quick and I need to know her real quick. And so that is a skill set of being able to connect um, through, and it's usually gonna always be through small talk. Big talks is what all of us go to, right? Small talk is, is you going out and individually seeking and, and connecting with people, so the relational part. Um, I also think, but if you wanna get into big action and start doing things, there's tons of, tons of work and tons of nonprofits who are out there doing it every single day. So if you wanna get in it and just get to work, I would just suggest volunteering. Councillor Edwards, uh, my name is Tice Motinas. I'm actually a resident of Rhode Island, but uh, from Massachusetts originally. But uh, my question for you is, you said that you reached across the aisle and you found a lot of Trump voters who supported you. And I was wondering if you had any tips or suggestions for reaching across the aisle. Um, yeah, I think, um, and that was to a lot of people's surprise, right? So they had defined what Charlestown will do. And Charlestown said, we don't care what you say about us. And then there was also the definition of who, whose doors I should be bothering to talk to. So. Um, there's a guy, Robbie, I won't give out his last name, he's in Charlestown, he is conser more conservative than Trump. He was also my biggest cheerleader. And it was for nothing politically I can trust, trust. There was nothing politically in terms of the decisions I would make or the arguments that I was making that would have convinced him to vote for me. So of course I had to ask him, I mean, with all, I love the vote, I love the support, but why me? I mean, and he said, because you knocked, so he has this huge Tea Party flag outside his door, and I came by and moved the flag out the way, knocked on the door, and he opened the door, and he said, you're Lydia Edwards, and I said, yes, I am. And, and he said, and I said, you're Robbie, and he said, yeah, yeah, and we had a very brief conversation. He said he's still making up his mind. I said, well, thank you for your time. And he said, you knocked on my door, you remembered my name, and you shook my hand, and I got his vote. And and I think it's really important because so much of this urgency and this emergency that we feel because of the current leadership, a lot of us are rushing towards the center, right? Rushing towards the center and, and, and saying, you know, don't make us have to choose. We can kind of all get this, you know, half-assed kind of thing, but all of us will at least not be like Trump, right? And so instead, I think running on all of me. So the fact that my mother was a veteran was a big deal for a lot of people. And I was proud of that, I didn't run from that. Um, the fact that I had free, I grew up on free lunch. And so I went from free lunch to becoming the first attorney in my family, that meant something to a lot of the folks. So I think, quite frankly, we are, we're, we're multidimensional. And I just don't believe that there's nobody in this world that I cannot connect with and have something in common with, who chooses to, to listen and have the conversation. So you have to believe that. Um, there's, there's, it's not, it's really lazy. Labels are lazy and it's really wrong to just, just say that this person is a Trump supporter, therefore the following and then fill in the blank. Any more than you can say this person supported Hillary Clinton and then fill in the blank. So. Uh, my name is Alex Perry. I would, I guess something that I feel first fierce urgency about is the plague of uh, opiate overdoses, gun violence. I think young youth, young adult males are a particularly at risk gr you know, group. Um, I think it's out of despair, but I just you know, would like some thoughts from all three of you from your different perspectives on this problem. I would say the despair and hopelessness and, you know, the, the question about future, things like that, that if you think about right now, when I was growing up, I was told, 
there's a one in nine chance that you won't make it to 25 or you'll be in jail. And if I allowed that to stick to me, then I would engage in a lot more irresponsible behavior. And I think so, so there's still, that hasn't changed. That sense of what your likelihood is as a black man has not changed in 40 years, which is kind of crazy. And so the other side of it is I just think our opiate issue is um, <clears throat> it's completely controlled um, by our corporations. And it's, it's a design, and we, we really need to go after, who, you know, it's not, the, it's not who's pulling it out of the medicine cabinet, who's not, it's not who's selling it on the corner, it's who's manufacturing it and lobbying to get these drugs passed so that they're so readily available. And if we're talking about act and some real action and not, and not small talk, that's an area where we really need to go after. Is, is, this is, it's corporate. And uh, what's the word? Um, cleansing. No, go ahead. I was going to pass in the mic. I don't, I don't know. I'm, the jury's still out for me on a couple of issues around that, quite frankly. You know, I think everybody needs help. Any addiction. Any addiction, opiate addiction, is just really out, out, outrageous. And I guess I just feel some type of way because I'm a little pissed off still for the fact that, you know, the opiate addiction thing came out, and now we're rushing, we're doing. And I think don't get it, don't get me wrong, because I used to be an alcohol and drug counselor, right, at Northside Hospital in, in Georgia. And so I think everybody needs help. When you need help, you need help. I'm just peed off because when it was the crack epidemic. Nobody was moving and doing anything, right? And so I'm a little disturbed. I still think, I think everybody needs help, but instead we were locking them up and saying they were no good and blah, 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 blah. And most of those people happen to be black and brown. And, and quite frankly, the opiate situation seems to be mostly, not mostly, because it, it crosses all barriers, but a lot of white. And because that came to fruition, all of a sudden we're paying, there's laws about it, there's all these issues around it and all this kind of stuff, and I'm a little teed off still. But I do think everybody needs help, and we should make sure that everybody gets the help that they need to, to handle the addictions that they may have. So. I'm not so much an expert in those issues. I think, just to t speak to your comment though, um, I think there is a lot of despair, there's a lot of angst, and, um, and I completely, I couldn't agree with you more, Chris. It is, is really hitting it where, who has access and who is creating not only just the opioids, but also guns, right? So there's two, two corporate entities that are making a lot of money, making deadly, um, deadly things available, and, and we're dying because of it. Our youth are dying because of it. So that's one access. This is the access point in the production of mass destructive things. But then there is the real... Uh, crisis of suicide, of depression, of despair that we're finding in, in a lot of young men and, and women, but especially in a lot of young men who tend I've, you know, to turn um, violence outwards, um, and, and many young women tend to turn it inwards, but you know, through eating disorders, things like that. So, so you end up in this situation where our youth, many of our youth, are, are, are self-destructing. And, and we're not, what is this emptiness that a lot of them feel and have? Um, and our, as a society, how, how did we get to this point? So we have the one end, how do we stop the mass, destru or mass production of deadly things? But, but the, the, the attraction towards those deadly things is another conversation. Uh, hi, my name is Hanya. I'm a student at the Fletcher School here at Tufts. Um, First of all, thank you for your time uh, in coming to share with us. Um, my question is, as someone um, who's from sort of a model minority background and is like upper class, but also, you know, um, is a woman of color, um, I'm wondering how, um, you know, Cheryl, you talked about giving the voice to the voiceless. Um, as someone with this privilege, how to um, navigate those spheres and um, be a voice, but not also take up space for others to speak for themselves. Thank you. I'm being a voice for the voiceless. Um, 
If you have that power, I say use it. Don't shy away from it. You, so let me just tell you, I grew up, so I was poor and didn't even know it, okay? We grew up, I had, I grew up in a two-parent household. My, both of my parents worked two jobs my whole life. I went to Catholic school, then I went to private school, high, uh, private high school, then I went to college and everything. Got out here in this real world and figured it out, right? Like, you broke, you poor. No. <laughs> like, everybody, people, my family didn't raise me like that. And so my family is mixed, right? right? We have um, the whole spectrum of color. I'm on the darker side of my family. But I didn't grow up feeling that in my household, right? My parents raised me. So that's how, if you have that voice and, and you do, then use it. Don't shy away from it. People, and teach people. Use your voice. Use that gift that you have of being fearless to talk to other people that feel fear. Let them watch you work. Right? Train them on the right words to say until they can figure them out for their self. But don't shy away from it. Use that. Um, okay. I, um, I, I reject the model minority myth, and, and I see it as only an attempt to divide people of color. Um, you find out how model you are um, until there's a ban on you. Right, so that's how quick uh, that's how quick you become a, a real minority, or I guess not model, is when is when all of a sudden um, you're seen as a threat. And so you can look at the Chinese Exclusion Act. You can see all different points, and I think it's really that we buy into or even accept this model minority myth is due to a lack of history. You will see copious amounts of times where people who are of Asian descent have been treated horribly by our legal system, by all institutions, have been demeaned. And so as a result, I think we've decided, oh, well, they still made it, right? They made it. Um, in reality, we're not looking at our immigration policies that put certain people here and deny access to other because they're not white, um, because they're not rich. So I, I, I see we need to pull back and study history and about a reality about what sets that myth up to believe that there are actually model minorities or not. And the other reason why I think it's really important we reject that is because they're not protesting, right? They're not taking a knee and they're model, see? So you can make it without all of that horrible protesting and crap and don't be mean and sad, be like that. And that is, that is we must reject it outright. So I hope you will um, reject it and see not as um, what you come with with all this privilege, but that you are part of the person of color's experience in the United States and your voice is, is belonged everywhere. And that when you do take on certain forms of discrimination, you are speaking like as a woman of color and saying, and what about her and him and them as well? That's what I hope, you know. <laughs> I would say for people who feel that they have the benefit of, of privilege um, and access, to use it. Uh, you are a door opener. You are the wedge in that door so it can't be shut again. Uh, use your access to allow others in, and that could be the role you play. You don't have to sit at the table, but if you get that door open and you flood it with a whole lot of people who've been trying to, that's a great use of your privilege and access. James Brown say, I don't need anybody to give me anything. Just open up the door. I'll get it myself. Mm, excellent. Philip, please. Last, this will be the last question. I, I swore I wasn't going to ask a question, but I, I think it's um, timely. For sure, um, Cheryl and Councilwoman uh, Lydia. Um, so we just had the Women's March, because you had this comment where you talked about moving together, and that requires conversation around intersectionality, and that is uh, deep and takes time and is complex. Um, and so I'm wondering where both of you place yourselves in this moment of like Me Too in terms of women's march and intersectionality and the role of women in politics. Because we saw, you know, with Anita Hill, a first wave of women elected politicians and in government. And now we're kind of in this second wave post-Trump, post-Hillary Clinton um, of women running for office. So I'm saying, where do, where do y'all, what advice do you have to women who think about 
being in government or being the politician, and where do you place yourselves um, in this moment, you know, generationally or um, elsewise? Um, I think there's a couple, there's a lot in that question, um, but just focusing on certain components of it, um, I think when I think of this, this, this now and this, this dialogue that we're having, I, I see personally myself as just doing what I've been doing, right? And the fact that there are a lot more people who are woke and taking to the streets is something that is beautiful and speaks to the moment. Um, I think what, what we should be doing is, as people are now doing things that they've never done before, and standing up and marching and doing things that they haven't done before, is to direct that energy, that nervous energy, and make sure that it can be sustained. And make sure that there are opportunities to, for not only their personal leadership, building a bench, I personally take that as a, as a personal endeavor, to build a bench to find young women in my district who want and need access to internships, to getting in there and, and leading and telling them that you need to lead, run this forum and do so on and so forth on my behalf. But also making sure that we are, are directing people to giving attention and, and, and resources toward movements that have been happening for years. They just haven't had this energy. Um, so I, I think right now, um, the Me Too movement is, is important, um, but sexual harassment is not new, right? What's new is the attention given and the fact that there are repercussions for the first time to very powerful men because of it. So taking that and directing it towards something else, like how are we training our boys? Why, why are we still having this conversation? And really while we have the attention driving it in a way that can hopefully come to solutions, not just highlighting the problems. Um. <clears throat> So I, I, we run, I run another program that's called the Women's Pipeline for Change, and it's for women of color that we bring in, if it's for grassroots women. Typically when people are looking for women to run for office, they're looking at the grass tops. I'm looking for the grassroots. These are the women that go to the school, the, that are, they have their ear to the ground, their children are in school, they know what's happening in the school system, in their neighborhoods, but they won't run for office. And it's been said over and over again that we have to ask a woman at least seven times to run before she even think about it. Why? Because we have to dot every I, cross every T. We run households. We have families. We have so much on our plate that we have to do. And then it don't make it easy for us to run. It's two, di two different standards, again, right, about women running. But I think women uh, make decisions, <laughs> right, quicker. I think we are in more inclusive. I think we add a different energy to the conversations. And so, yes, I do think women need to run. But our Women's Pipeline for Change, we bring them in for an eight-month training program, one Saturday per month, and we politicize them. These are women that have never, ever even really thought about running or anything else. But we, like someone like me that, that's in this space, can identify them and really encourage them to join this program. And it's for women that are thinking about being elected, being appointed, running campaigns, just being executive directors or what have you. But we really have to encourage them to run. When we look at all the movements that are happening now, the only thing I want to say about that is that we have to move collectively. So when we had the first women's the march last year and everything, and someone was asking me, they said they did not see a lot of women of color at the march. And I simply said to them, it's because you invited us to the march and we needed to help be a part of the creation of the march. Because we show up. Women of, we, we all show up, women show up, you know, and women of color show up. And we don't want to be invited. We don't want a piece of the pie, we want to make the pie. And until that happens, see this whole thing that we're going through is, reaches everything. But I think the ground is fertile right now for us to have open conversations. Just don't shy away from them. Let's just have these conversations, put everything on the table and go for it. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Chris, Cheryl, Counselor Edwards. This was an amazing panel. Um, 
I want to thank you for your leadership on the ground. I know that you're, on, you're all on the front lines doing really important work. We partner with them. We hope to partner with Counselor Edwards' office. So students, if you're interested, let us know. Check out our website. Um, but I really want to thank you for your insights and um, the wisdom that you brought to the conversation today that I hope will inspire and nourish us for the, the ongoing struggle that we're all facing you know, in this world and on this campus. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.